So, starting Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, don't think we will, but I'm going to try to get us, there's no way we're going to, I won't even say it. Um, I had written a bunch of stuff on the board, today's Tuesday, last Thursday, hopefully you wrote that down, and I had stuff about the date of the poem, circa 1390, part of the alliterative revival, centered on the town of, according to J.R.R. Tolkien in his edition, the dialect of the poem has kind of as its focal point the town of Chester, which is in northwest England. And he limited the, how do I want to put this? He limited the composition of the poem to about a 30 mile diameter, okay, with Chester at its center. Tolkien, his ability with languages was almost unmatched. He could speak, I think it is something like a dozen, and he read or could read, uh, if I remember right, it's somewhere like between 14 to 20. He started learning foreign languages, I believe it was at eight, when he began learning Greek and then Latin, taught himself Gothic, etc. Okay? Um, Cotton Hero A10 has the plural poem, Patience, Purity, also called Cleanliness. The poet, if you write about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you will refer to the poet as either the plural poet or the Gawain po or Gowan poet, um, etc. I want to jump into the poem because I do want to try to do a lot today. There's a quiz due Friday. It's over fits one and two. We will definitely finish fit two by um, Thursday, end of Thursday. What I'd like you to do, because you were already supposed to have read that, finish the entire poem. I don't think we'll finish. There is like a 5% chance that we could finish Sir Gown and the Green Knight. Um, by the end of Thursday, depending on how much we get done today. So, pages 226, 227. Read the introduction, talks about you know possible source material, the Rick Cruz feast, the fled Rick Cream, et cetera. This is the only thing that I have on the uh, board that I do want to briefly mention. Three motifs or elements, and they're interwoven like fabric, okay? The beheading game, the exchange of winnings game, you can, all, you can call all three of these games, and the temptation game, okay? The first one is brought back in the end, is brought back at the end, all right? And these two are in between, but they're tied to the end, which then brings it back to the beginning. So there, there aren't loose threads, in other words, okay? How's the poem open? Where does it open? Let me put it that. Or let me put it that way. Even before that. Um, Brutus. Troy, Brutus. Why? Because as part of British populist mythology. Now let me rephrase that. It was part of British popular mythology that the Brits were descended from the ancient Trojans. Brit Brute. There's a medieval work called The Brute, B-R-U-T. It doesn't refer to a knuckle driver, you know, ogre kind of person. It refers to the founding of Britain by the descendants of Troy, okay? I, you know, just my own thinking, I don't know why you'd want to claim descendancy from the Trojans. They lost. So with that, like Rome did this, and so now we see that Britain did it. Are there other countries that did this as well? In terms of Troy? Or Aeneas and Aeneas? That I don't know. It's a good question. I would think if anything you'd want to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a descendant of the ancient Achaeans, of Agamemnon and those guys. Um, but the Greeks claim that, so, you know. Anyways. So... Get to the second, where does the poem begin? And as she said, we're at Arthur's court. 
Notice what it's not called. Notice where they aren't physically at. Camelot. Okay? The poem is set, well, the king's print that, sorry, my brain was confusing what we were doing today with what we did last week. I was thinking land ball. We are at Camelot. We're not at Carlisle. We're at Camelot. Okay? Round table. And what time of year is it? Christmas. See, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to tell myself because I was going to say it's Pentecost, but that, again, that's land ball. It's Christmas time. All right? Is it Christmas Day? No. It's when? New Year's. So what? I'm trying to think how to put this question. Christmas is still being celebrated. How? Twelve days of Christmas. Twelve days of Christmas go from Christmas Day until what's called the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. That's when the revels, the Christmas revels, end. Okay? So they're still celebrating the feast of Christmas. All right? Um, I'm going to skip a bunch. Line 70 and following. About line 73 is where I'm going to pick up. The noblest knight in a higher seat, as seemed proper, Queen Guinevere gaily dressed, placed in the middle, seated on the upper level, adorned all about, fine silk is surrounding her, etc., etc. Okay, she's the loveliest to look on. But Arthur, we're told, line 85, Arthur would not eat until everyone was served. He was so lively in his youth and a little boyish. So Arthur's being described how? He's young. See, in a lot of Arthurian literature, Arthur's older. He's like my age. And the knights are younger. Lancelot isn't Arthur's age. Lancelot should be a good 20 years younger. He's young and strong and, you know, virile and all that kind of stuff. While Arthur's, um, in, in a lot of literature, has like one foot in the grave. Okay? So we get conditions that must be met before Arthur will start to eat. What are they? What are some of them? And they're not, you know, each condition. It's this or this or this or this. What's the first one mentioned? He won't, have you served. he won't eat until everyone is served. How big is Camelot? 100 knights of the round table. That kind of then assumes there's probably 100 women too. Plus squires and pages. That's the order of, you know, moving up in the rank, so to speak, to become a knight. The pages were boys, 8 to 12 years old or so. Then you became a squire, and you have new responsibilities. And that's from age 12 or 13 to 18 to 20 or so. Okay, each of those, even though my numbers aren't exactly right, are about seven-year periods. What do we have today that's based on that model? Apprentice, journeyman, master, if you're in the trades. You become an apprentice plumber, a journeyman plumber, and then a master plumber, apprentice carpenter, etc. That all goes back to the Middle Ages model. Okay? <clears throat> so, everybody has to be served. Why did I say how many people are there? Question, does Arthur get served first or last? Okay, if he gets served first, and everybody else has to be served before he's going to eat, what's that say about his food? It's going to be cold. Okay? Which could be a sign of humility on Arthur's part. I don't know if he is served first or last. It's just an interesting little thing. So that's the first possibility. What else? We're told... Uh, on such a special day, line 92, until he had been told a curious tale about some perilous thing or of some great wonder that he could believe of princes, of battles, or other marvels, or 
So the first thing is everybody has to be certain. That's a, that's a non-negotiable. Then he wants to hear some marvelous, wonderful tale. Or some knight begged him for a trustworthy foe to oppose him in jousting. In hazard to set his life against his opponents, each letting the other as luck would assist him gain the upper hand. This was the king's custom. Wonderful, marvelous fairy tale kind of thing. Or a knight requests, I want to joust with somebody else. Okay? So they're sitting there, they're joking, they're talking, they're eating. Arthur's been, you know, seemingly. Everybody's been served, etc. We get the names of knights and bishops who are sitting there. Skip a bunch. First course is brought in with trumpets blaring. Colorful banner, banners hanging from everywhere. Notice, I've skipped an awful lot. Why? What is it mostly that I've skipped so far? Names. What else? Descriptive details about the people, clothing, the food, the decorations. Who do those things appeal to? Other nobles. That is another indication of the audience of this tale. This is designed to appeal to people who would be familiar with the language used to describe all of these things. Poor peasant out in the field who works with his hands and back all day long, goes back home and eats slop out of a wooden bowl, probably is not going to be that entertained by something like this. Okay? So, I mean, look, line 156, 155, with gray shining ermine and his hood of the same thrown back from his hair, laid over his shoulders, neatly tight drawn stockings colored to match, clinging to his calf and shining, blah, 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 blah. Okay? That's all what? That's all part of the description of the Green Knight. So the Green Knight rides in, line 130 and following. First course has been served. He rides in on his horse, just like the lady and her ladies serving her did in Lawnball. Rides right up to Arthur's table. Only there's a difference between what the Green Knight does and what the Fairy Queen's ladies do and what the Fairy Queen herself does. In Lawnball, they ride right up to Arthur. They know who the king is. Why? Neon sign behind that says king? No. In most medieval literature, take that back, all medieval literature, there is something about the king that speaks king. It makes it very clear. And it's a not, you know, a symbol. It's not a crown necessary. It is that person has the mark of kingship that you can just see. Now, in some tales, there's literally a mark on the person. One tell this one guy who's a future king, he sleeps and he sleeps with his mouth open and a light shines from his mouth. That's the mark that he's the king. Anyways, in bursts at the hall, line 136, at the hall door, a terrible figure. It's kind of like Grendel, right? Grendel touches the doors, they burst open. Only this one is a monster. Well, maybe not. In his stature, the very tallest on earth, from the waist to the neck, so thick, set, and square, and his loins and his limbs so massive and long. In truth, half a giant, I believe he was. But anyway, he's the biggest of all men. Most attractive of his size, who could sit on a horse for a while, and back and chest his body was forbidding, both his belly and his waist were becomingly trim. I mean, this guy is ripped. He's like Mr. Olympia. Big, broad shoulders and chest, need a tiny waist. His hue astounded them. Hue. What is hue? Color. Color. Set in his look so keen, for boldly he rode in, completely emerald green. How green is the green knight? Green skin, green beard, green hair, green clothes, green horse. Okay. Okay. And we get a long description of his clothing. 
and his hair and his beard, which we're going to skip, the pendants on the trappings of the horse accoutrements, etc. Uh, again, plated with gold thread in the horse's mane, etc. Bells, skipping a bunch. Skipping to. <laughs> Lines 224 and following. So, a lot of description of the Green Knight. Yes? Uh, when they said his head was as broad as a measuring rod, what does that refer to? I don't know specifically for the Middle Ages. What would a quote unquote measuring rod be today? You could say a ruler or a yardstick. So is his head three feet wide? Well, his axe, we're going to be told, the axe blade, I think it is the blade, from point to point is four feet. Big stinking axe, by the way. This isn't like a five pound axe head. This thing's 50, 75 pounds, because it's steel. So whatever it is, okay, let's say it's a, a ruler. This guy's got a big head. If it's a ruler, 12 inches wide. So he comes in. He rides right up to the high dais. Looks Arthur in the face. Where is the governor of this crowd? Glad should I be to clap eyes on the man and exchange with him a few words. He looks down at the knights as he rides up and down. So he rides down the table, not, or, not king, not king, not king, not king, not king, and he rides down the other way. Not king, not king, not king. In other words, I can't make out the king. Who is the king here? And they just sit there dumbfounded. They don't speak a word. It's as though we're told line 244, everyone fell asleep. Then Arthur kind of wakes up. Then Arthur, 250, confronts the wonder before the high table, salutes him politely. Not exactly sure what that means. Whether that means a physical salute, you know, nods his head. I don't think it's a, this kind of salute. And says, sir, welcome indeed to this place. I'm master of this house. My name is Arthur. It's like, hi, my name's Artie. Take a seat, you know. Pull a chair up, we'll feed you. Be pleased to dismount, spend some time here. What you have come for, we shall learn later. In other words, it doesn't matter why you're here, sit down, have some lunch. What's Arthur showing, by the way? What's he demonstrating? Hospitality out the wazoo. I mean, this is almost unheard of. No, 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 by heaven. And by him who sits there. So the knight swears by God. To spend time in this house was not the cause of my coming. But because your name, sir, is so highly regarded and your city and your warriors reputed the best. So your name is highly regarded and your city and your warriors are reputed the best. Notice he doesn't say in your city and your warriors are the best. Fame, your reputation, is the best. Dauntless in armor and on horseback afield, the most valiant and excellent of all living men, courageous as players and other noble sports. That is, these are all the things they are reputed to be. And here, courtesy is displayed as I have heard tell, again, reputed, and that has brought me here truly on this day, you may be assured by this branch I carry that I approach you in peace, seeking no battle. There's another edition I have where it's mentioned the branch. I think it's holly, okay, which was a sign of peace. Um... I don't seek a battle. Why? For had I traveled in fighting dress in warlike manner, 
I have a halberd at home, a helmet too, shield, keen spear, shining bright, other weapons to brandish. I assure you as well. That is, I could have come armed to the teeth, but I'm not. So he doesn't have a shield. He doesn't have a halberd, a breastplate. He doesn't have a spear. He doesn't have a sword. What's he carrying with him? An axe. But since I look for no cumbered, uh, combat, I'm not dressed for battle. But if you are as courageous as everyone says, notice the if implies what? You're not. It's a condition. You will graciously grant me. What's the next word? The game. What word could he use? The request. But he doesn't say request. The game that I ask. What's a game? Take Suzanne Collins out of your mind. Okay, this isn't the Hunger Games. She kind of ruined the idea of gaming, you know. Are games serious? No, they're fun. It's what time of year is it? What are they doing? Revelry. Okay? It's just part of the fun in games, so to speak. Grant me the game that I ask for by right. Arthur has apparently not listened to what the knight said. If you seek, courteous knight, a combat without armor, you will not lack a fight. Did he say, I want a combat without armor? If you are as courageous as everyone says, you will give me this combat without armor that I, that's not what he said. It's a game, okay? Let it stick in your heads. Game, game, game. You want to fight? You'll have a fight, buddy. No, I seek no battle. I assure you truly. He could have stopped there, right? Just like Longwall could have said, is that a knock on the door? Could have said, Guinevere, uh uh. But he goes on. Those about me in this hall are but beardless children. Okay. Arthur's here, Guinevere's to his right, Lancelot is to her right. Over next to Arthur, on the other side, if I remember right, is a bishop. Next to him is. Um, Yvain, Agravain, one of the others, one of um, Gawain's cousins. And then you have Launcelot, Bors, Bedivere, Bob. These are all what kind of knights? Little clones of Chris Hemsworth. Okay? Big, brawny, muscular, famous for winning battles. What has he just called them? Beardless children. What does that mean? What does that mean? Prepubescent boys. You boys haven't even gone through adolescence yet. That's what he's implying, not stating literally. Okay, so you're a long slot. You're Gawain. You're Arthur. He said it about Arthur. What do you do at that point? Well, once you scoop your jaw up off the ground and put it back into your mouth, you're like, what did he just call us? No one here could match me with their feeble powers. Feeble can have two contexts. It can refer to physical strength or it can refer to mental strength. Physically, you guys are all weaklings, babies compared to me. Mentally, you're all morons compared to me. To be feeble-minded means to be literally like an idiot. Literal definition. IQ of like 80 or lower. I think it is 80. might be 60. He says, no, 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 no. 
If I were locked in my armor on a great horse, no one here could match me with their feeble powers. Therefore, I ask of the court a Christmas game. This is just for fun. Come on, let's play. For it is Yule and New Year, and here are brave men in plenty. If anyone in this hall thinks himself bold enough, so dowdy in body and reckless in mind, dowdy, mm, brawny. What does reckless mean? Reckless endangerment, reckless driving. Without regard. Good, because you're using it according to its real original meaning. Wreck is in the verb to reckon. Or as Gerard Manley Hopkins puts it in the poem whose name is title is just Escape Me, men now not wreck his rod. Okay, he's talking about people don't pay any attention to God. Wreck means thought. Reckless, thoughtless. So dowdy in body and thoughtless in mind as to strike a blow fearlessly and take one in return. Why would that be thoughtless? Come on, you and me, let's go. Outside. And guess what? You get to take the first shot. Now, think about it in this culture, that kind of implies what? If I hit him hard enough, he doesn't get back up. Why would somebody offer to do that? Hmm. The game is what? Rigged. So, if you do this and take one in return, you can have this mighty axe. Big shiny, you know, cue the Vanna White. She comes out and does the hand thing. And look at the axe. It's shiny. It's nice. This ponderous axe to use as he pleases, and I shall stand the first blow. Here's part of the game. You can use this X, and I'll just stand here. Okay, so what do you do with an X? You chop, you split, you cut in two. You don't hold the X by the head and beat somebody with the handle. You don't take the X and stab. You swing and slice. If anyone is fierce enough to take up my challenge, run to me quickly, take this weapon. I renounce all claim to it. Let him keep it as his own, and I'll stand his first bl the blow, unflinching on this floor. But, but, provided, you give me the right to deal such a blow in return. But, I'll give you a year and a day before you get the return blow. So what are they all thinking? Notice, if he petrified them at first, that is, when he first came in, even stiller were then all the courtiers in that place, the great and the small. Why? Because I think they're trying to wrap their heads around this offer. Big giant guy. Probably the height of this room. So he's going to let one of us take a first whack at him. As long as we agree, before we take the whack, that he gets to return the stroke in a year and a day. But there's no problem with that, right? What's the problem? But if I chop his head off, because that's what axes are used for in capital punishment, if I chop his head off, how does he come back? You would sign your name down underneath the 301002. How does he come back in a year and a day and chop my head off? That part doesn't compute. So they're trying to figure out what? What's the catch? He looks up and down. What? Is this Arthur's house? Come on, guys. Man up that everyone talks of in so many kingdoms, where are now your arrogance and your victories? Why doesn't he say, where are now your pride and your victories? Which is worse, arrogance or pride? 
Arrogance is worse. Everybody has an amount of pride. Not everybody is arrogant. Arrogant means what? Pride on steroids. It's, I'm not only really good, I'm what? The goat. Greatest of all time. Okay? Your fierceness and wrath and your great speeches. Okay, fierceness and wrath, those are demonstrated. Speeches? It's all words, man. Anybody can talk great. Now the revelry and repute of the round table are overthrown with a word from one man's mouth. For you all cower in fear before a block is before a blow has been struck. He's talking about what blow? The return blow, not the first blow. At least I think that's what he's saying. And then he laughs. He, you know, Arthur's right here, and he just laughs in Arthur's face. That has the intended effect. That does exactly what he wants it to do. Because what does Arthur do? The blood rushed into his fair face and cheek for shame. Line 317, 319. Arthur, Arthur grew red with rage, as all the others did. What does it mean to grow red with rage? What is rage? Is rage a as Polonius will tell his son Laertes in Hamlet, a well-proportioned thought. No, it's not proportioned at all because it's not a thought. Rage is what? A, a state. It's a good way of putting it. It takes you over. It overcomes you. It is entirely a reaction. The king, by nature bold, approved that, approached that man. In other words, he gets up out of his chair, walks around the table, he comes up next to him. Sir, by heaven, what you demand is absurd. Why is it absurd? And since you have asked for folly that you deserve, why is it absurd? If one of us gives you our best blow, you're not going to be meeting them in a year and a day. It doesn't make any sense. You ask for folly, foolishness, that's what you deserve. How did the Green Knight originally couch the offer? What's it called? A game. Are games to be taken seriously? No. They're fun. They're frivolity. They're unreality. It's when games get taken too seriously that things fall apart, you know. European, what's called hooliganism. Football, soccer. Some people take their soccer so seriously. I just read something a couple weeks ago. Some 18, 19, I don't remember what age he is, 20-year-old kid has been banned from all English football for four years. He literally cannot step foot in any stadium. And I remember correctly, it was because of some racial epithet that he used against somebody. Okay? So, he goes, you want to take a blow? Okay. No man known to me fears your boastful words. Hand over your battle axe in God's name, and I shall grant the wish that you've requested. You want me to hit you? Okay. Hand it over. The Green Knight, proudly, we're told, dismounts. He's like, yes. Arthur has the axe, grips it by the shaft, grimly swings it about. That is, he's getting the feel for it. He's getting the heft of it. He wants to find out how finely balanced the head is and all that kind of stuff. Towering before him stood the bold man, taller than anyone in the court by more than a head. 
Standing there, grim face, he stroked his beard. Almost like, go ahead, swing that axe. Then bowed the good Gawain, line 340. Stop. That's what his words mean. Stop. And he begs Arthur to do what? Let me do it. If you would, noble lord, bid me rise from my seat, stand at your side, if without discourtesy I might leave the table and that my liege lady were not displeased, I would offer you counsel before your royal court, for it seems to me unfitting if the truth be admitted when so arrogant a request is put forward in hall, that is, the knight is the one full of arrogance, not us, even if you want to do it, to undertake it yourself while so many brave men sit about you in their places, who I think, blah, blah. Any knight here, Sir Gawain says, could be the one to take the, the swing. Okay? I am the weakest of them. I'm the weakest of all the knights here. I know in the dullest minded, feeblest in mind. Okay? So he says, any knight here would be willing to take this guy. I, what's he saying, really, by saying I am the physically weakest and the unsmartest, the dumbest? Let me, the least of these, take it. Let me do it. Why? Because that will show the greatness and magnificence of Arthur's court. Here this guy, a giant, half giant, came in, issues this challenge, challenges their manliness, challenges their reputations, and Sir Gawain says, I'm the stupidest. Let me try. You know, he drags his knuckles on the ground, seemingly. So my death would be least loss. If he kills me, notice what Sir Gawain is suggesting. What if I don't kill him? Then in a year and a day, he gets the return blow, and I'm a dead man. If I die... Camelot is not the less. Arthur hasn't suffered anything. Notice what that also suggests. What if somehow, whatever the blow is, the Green Knight lives? Whoever takes that stroke, that axe, and tries to hit him with it, that person is going to die in a year and a day. Because look at this guy. Only because you are my uncle am I to be praised. See, nepotism isn't new. <laughs> Why does he get a sit next to Guinevere? Uncle Artie, Uncle Artie, can I sit next to Gwynny, you know? No virtue I know in myself but your blood. Blood virtue. Blood relationship. We're going to see when we get to the wife of Bath's tale. Didn't mention this in my first class. Should have. The wife of Bath's tale is entirely about noble behavior. Or the word that gets used throughout her tale, not as much her prologue, gentilessa. True nobility. And she's going to tell us true nobility doesn't come from blood. It doesn't come from an inheritance. It doesn't come from heritage. Watch A Knight's Tale. Because the character of Will Thatcher, William Thatcher, shows true gentilessa, even though he's the son of a Thatcher. But he becomes a knight. Why? Because the Black Prince knights him because of his gentilessa. It's, it's one of the greatest things in film history, I think, in terms of a portrayal of an idea from the Middle Ages. Interestingly, it is an idea that in some senses is still with us today. Does behavior, excuse me, does worth come from bloodline? Does value come from who you're related to? Or does it have to do with how one behaves? So, Arthur says, go ahead, come here. 
And then he tells them. Arthur tells Gawain, 372. First he blesses Sir Gawain, like, God bless you, my son, as you depart this life. And says, take care, nephew, that you strike one blow. And if you deal it aright, truly I believe you will wait a long time for his stroke in return. What advice has Arthur just given Sir Gawain? Kill him! Kill the SOB. He challenged you, he challenged me, he challenged all of us. Kill him. Why? How long a time will it be before you have to accept the return blow? Forever. As in never. What student in my first class said, is that light to tease? I said, Probably, I've never heard Lytotes used to, as a uh, term of literary technique for the Middle Ages, however, but it clearly is understatement. Okay. So Gawain approaches the big man, waits for him, and the knight says, well, hold on there, stud, before you go swinging the axe, you know, let's Repeat our agreement. First, who are you? Notice he doesn't have a name tag. You know, what's your name? You shall tell me truly that I may believe you. Sir Gowan says, I'm called Gawain, or Gowan. Who deals you this blow? Whatever happens after. On this day next year to accept another from you with what weapon you choose and from no other person on earth. Kind of interesting, because the knight said a year and a day. Now Gawain says, this day next year. Year and a day would be January 2nd. Gawain says, no, New Year's. We'll do it on New Year's, you know. I'll accept a return blow from you with whatever weapon you choose. Why is it with whatever weapon you choose? Because the axe is mine. <laughs> I get to keep it. And the implication is, if I don't die, I'm not bringing the axe with me. So you'll have to have some other weapon. Sir Gawain, as I live, I'm extremely glad this blow is yours to give. Why? Sir Gawain said, I'm the least. I'm the lowest of all these knights. Wouldn't you think he wants the greatest, strongest, most powerful knight to do it? Probably. So that kind of begs the question. When Gawain said... I am the weakest of them and dullest minded. Was he telling the truth? Or was he merely showing humility? By God, says the green knight. Sir Gowan, I am pleased that I shall get from your hands what I have asked for here. And you fully repeat it exactly as I said. So cool that you will seek me. Sir Gawain, where will I find you? Let me write it down. Where's your dwelling? Who are you? What's your name? Okay. Tell me all these things. And the knight says, um, I will tell you all that by my pledged word will tell you that it is in the future by my pledged word my vow it's enough for now it means nothing more come on take a swing and he bends over if i answer you truly after taking the blow and you have dexterously struck me i will tell you at once of my house my home my proper name then you can pay me a visit and keep your word but if I say nothing, then you will fare better. What's he implying? If I can't say anything, if I'm dead, you're off. The contract is null and void. So take up your weapon and let's see how you smite. Smite is a verb usually used to imply killing. Destruction. Sir Gawain says, gladly indeed. And he wets the metal bit. Now, 
wet, W-E-T-T-I-N-G, kind of implies he pulls out of his pocket a sharpening stone, spits on it, and starts just putting a nice, you know, razor sharp edge on it. Green Knight takes up his position, bows his head a little, uncovers the flesh. Why does he bow his head? Because we're told he's over a head taller than anybody else in the room. For Sir Gowan to take his head off, he's going to swing upwards. It's kind of hard. So the knight probably liked to tease again by saying he bows his head a little. He probably does this. Body parallel to the ground. Gives Gowan a good target. Pulls his collar back and his hair up. Exposes the bare neck. And what does Sir Gowan do, we're told? He grasps the axe, 421, lifts it high, sets his left foot before him on the ground. What is that telling us about Sir Gowan? He's right-handed. He's going to swing that axe up over his right shoulder. This hand's going to be up near the axe head as he brings it up. And as he brings it down, if you've ever split wood, you bring it down like this, you get more force. What kind of swing is he going for? Swing for the stands. <laughs> He's going for a home run. How hard does he swing? He brought it down swiftly on the bare flesh so that the bright blade slashed through the man's spine and cut through the white flesh, severing it in two so that the shiny steel blade bit into the floor. Now the floor here is not dirt, nor is it wood. It's stone. It sticks into the stone. So the Green Knight's body falls to the ground. It's Monty Python, right? Nope. The handsome head flew from the neck to the ground. Many courtiers kicked at it as it rolled past. Blood spurts from the trunk. Gleamed on the green dress, the clothing, not literal dress. Yet the man neither staggered nor fell. Just standing like this and psh and then stands up, and what happens? We're no longer in Kansas, Toto. <laughs> that hasn't happened before. You cut somebody's head off, the head falls, the body falls, but sprang forward vigorously on powerful legs and fiercely reached out where knights were standing, grabbed at his fine head, and snatched it up quickly. Okay, here's a question. How does he know, sorry, it, the body, how does it know where the head is? <laughs> yeah, little eyes sprout on the trunk of the neck, I don't know. But it knows somehow where the head is, grabs the head by the hair, goes over to the horse, mounts the horse, holds the head up, and the head speaks. As if he had suffered no injury. See, Gawain, that you carry out your promise exactly, line 448. Search for me truly until I am found. As you have sworn in this hall, in the company of, in the hearing of these knights, make your way, oh, we get the directions, to the green chapel. I charge you to get such a blow as you have dealt. What, what does everybody think at this point? Damn. <laughs> Glad it's him, not me. Is Sir Gowan going to be able to pull off this trick? Huh. As a knight of the Green Chapel, I am widely known, so if you make search to find me, you cannot possibly fail. That's a challenge. If you seriously look for me, what? You will find me. The implication is, you don't find me, you didn't look. You broke your promise. You broke your covenant, you broke your vow. In other words, everything that you are as a knight of the round table will be proven false. And if it's proven false, then what? The whole round table is proven false. Okay? So Arthur doesn't let out that he's deeply astonished. What does that mean? 
deeply astonished, scared, itless, <laughs> possible. He talks to Guinevere, shh, 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 don't let anything distress you, he says. Such strange goings on are fitting at Christmas. What? Somebody was just decapitated in your dining room on Christmas. There's still blood on the ground. It's not like when he picks up the head, gets on the horse, the blood kind of magically goes and back inside. Somebody's got to get down there and wipe it up. Why are such strange goings on fitting at Christmas? Putting on interludes, laughing and singing. What's Christmas? It's about the strangest going on you can imagine if you think about it. What's Christmas celebrate or commemorate? The incarnation, the birth of the God that exists outside all existence, all the universe, everything, becoming a 8-pound, 2-ounce, 19-inch, pooping, peeing little baby. Just, you know, strange goings on, right? So, he says, let's dig in. I've seen a marvel. That's what I wanted to see. Hang up your axe, Sir Gowan. And he does, and we get part two. Part two. New Year's Day comes and goes. I mean, that was New Year's Day. The rest of it comes and goes. Winter comes and goes. Lent comes and goes that we are heard described as 502. Each season in turn following the other after Christmas came mean-spirited Lent that tries the body with fish and plainer nourishment. Mean-spirited doesn't mean angry. doesn't mean harsh. It means kind of mean to the spirit. The spirit gets low during Lent. Why? Not only because of fish and plainer nourishment. Lent is a time of spiritual introspection. For what purpose? To acknowledge one's sinfulness. To look at oneself as one really is, not like one's press clippings, one's reputation is. Okay? Is to acknowledge, I'm not so great in here. So it lessens, it lowers, it humiliates the spirit. Why? Because it's a journey to Easter. It's a self-crucifixion with Christ. Okay? Or a crucifixion of the self is a better way of putting it. Unless you're Philippine, every year, Easter, you'll see pictures, get on dreads and stuff, and you'll see people literally being crucified to identify with Christ. I mean, literally. Nails through the hands, ankles, whole nine yards. They don't Stay on the cross for days. Okay? So, Lent comes and goes. Summer comes and goes. Fall comes in. Doesn't quite go. Page 240, line 536. Until All Saints Day, Sir Gowan lingers in court. When is All Saints Day? When is... Louder? November 1st. How do you know that? All Hallows Eve. October 31st. Okay. All Hallows Day, your translation here, All Saints Day. Look at the left hand column. Yet quill, that's while, All Hall Day. Hall. Hallows. The saints are the Hallows. Kind of changes the meaning if you're familiar with the Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. The sainted things. The sanctified things. Harry Potter's parents, by the way, just a little side note, die on what day? October 31st, 1981. Okay? What's the next day? All Hallows Day. In the first book, when Harry is brought to the Dursleys, McGonagall says to Professor Dumbledore, today, November 1st, will be known in the future as Harry Potter Day. 
Later on in the series of novels, Harry gets referred to as Saint Potter. Hallowed Potter. He's got to master the hallows, etc. So, those books are a lot more than just about, ooh, magic and so, you know, wizards and other nonsense. So, he tells Arthur, I gotta go. I, I gotta go find this guy. I gotta find the Green Chapel. It's now what? Two months. Exactly to the day. Okay? So, we're told the noblest in the court, like 550, gather together, and we get some of them named. And they encourage Sir Gowan. They help him get dressed to go on his journey. And we get a big, long description that we're going to skip most of. To describe his being dressed for the journey. His armor, his greaves, his gauntlet, everything. Okay? His horse's description of its harness and all that gets described. Then, page um, 242, line 619, they bring out his shield. And now we are going to spend some time talking about it. Line 620, with the pentangle painted on it in pure gold. Pentangle, five-pointed star. Okay, why? Five angles. One, two, three, four, five. He swings it over his baldric, throws it around his neck, where it suited the knight extremely well. And why the pentangle should befit that noble prince, I intend to explain, even should that delay me. In other words, it's like the speaker of the poem says, okay, we're going to get bogged down here for a little bit, even though this has really not a lot to do with the rest of the tale. We get the long description of the shield, and the pentangle is never referred to again. It's one of the most enigmatic passages in all of English literature. Because it's implied that this thing is really, really, really important, it never is referred to. It's never referred to in any other English literature other than modern people who are referring back to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Even though the, the narrator says, um, its design is continuous, and in England it's called everywhere, I am told, the endless knot. No, no, it's not referred to anywhere else. It's, it's not referred to everywhere. Okay? So, it's a symbol devised by Solomon. Who is Solomon? Other than a son of David. Pray to God. God said, I'll grant you your wish. What do you want? No. Nope. Long life? Nope. Wealth? Nope. Women? He gets that on his own. Wisdom. The wisdom of Solomon. And there are all kinds of stories about the wisdom of Solomon. He lost his wisdom. 700 concubines. 300 wives. I've been married to my wife for almost 38 years. I can't imagine. 38 of them. Okay, just crazy. I love my wife. I'm not dissing her by any means. So, he goes on. The narrator goes on. It is a figure consisting of five points where each line overlaps and locks into another. That's why after I drew this, and I got rid of the lines in between, I do these little loops, because it's they're linked that way. Okay? Why? It's showing you can't separate this line from this line. Or this line from this line. They're all connected. Okay? Why this symbol suits this knight in his shining arms, line 631? Therefore, it suits this knight in his shining arms for always faithful in five ways and five times in each way. So it's like five and five, five and five, five and five, five and five, five and five. So he's faithful in essentially 25 individual particular ways. But each of these fives 
can be subsumed under a larger heading if you want. So, for example, for always faithful in five ways and five times in each case, Gawain was reputed as virtuous, like refined gold, devoid of all vice, and with all courtly virtues adorned. So what are the courtly virtues? Before we get to that, so this new painted sign, that kind of implies the sign hadn't existed before. They create this for Sir Gawain. First, he was judged perfect in his five senses. How perfect? I don't mean like 98% perfect. No, perfect is perfect. But how was he perfect in his five senses? He never touched something he shouldn't touch. He never looked at something he shouldn't see. He never heard something he shouldn't hear. He never smelled something he shouldn't smell. No idea what. And he, shouldn't, he never tasted something he shouldn't taste. So he's perfect. What else? Next, his five fingers. That doesn't mean like three on one hand and two on the other. Five in each hand. His five fingers never lost their dexterity. You know, one of the reasons I had surgery was carpal tunnel. Why? Carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel. My whole hand would go numb. First it would tingle, like needles, and then it would go numb because of the pressure on those nerves. He never had that problem. What else? And all his earthly faith was in the five wounds of Christ that he suffered on the cross. They don't really add up. Head, crown of thorns. Hands, now I don't know if that's head. Hands count as one. Feet or ankles, so that's either one or two. Spear in the side, that's one. So if it's one, two, that's three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, whatever. It's either five or six, but it doesn't really matter. Possibly, I didn't even think of, one crown of thorns, two the hands, three the side, four the ankles, five the scourging. That's got to be what it is. The scourging before the crucifixion. What, what, what happened in scourging? Anybody know? Just a whip? Like a bull whip? The scourge was like a cat of nine tails. Cat of nine tails... You have leather thongs, and at the end of each thong, have any of you ever tried to climb over like a barbed wire fence in shorts <clears throat> and ever get caught by the barbed wire? It could be pretty painful. It's like the barbed wire barbs at the end of the leather thongs. And you do that against somebody's back, and those barbs grab into the skin, and when you pull, it rips the skin off. Okay? Okay. Roman law was, if you were not accused of capital punishment, you could receive 39 lashes. It's 39 strikes with that. Okay? Paul says something about he received the 39 lashes twice. He goes on. So, five wounds of Christ. Next thing, the five joys of Mary. Whenever that he crossed, suffered on the cross, wherever this man found himself in battle, his fixed thought was that above all other things, all his fortitude should come from the five joys of the mild queen of heaven. The five joys of Mary. Annunciation, why? Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of the womb, for you have found favor with God, etc. The Annunciation is coming up this weekend in the Christian church. March 25th, why? Nine months later, perfectly to the date, December 25th. Then the incarnation, Jesus is born. Crucifixion, yeah. How joyful is that? Mary sitting there at the foot of the cross as he's being crucified, naked, blood streaming everywhere, you know. Crucifixion, resurrection, definitely joy there. And the fifth one, the Gallon poet doesn't inter doesn't um, Invent these joys. 
There are lists of these in the Middle Ages. The fifth one, it's one of two. It can be either the ascension, when Jesus ascends into heaven 40 days after the crucifixion, okay, or what's called either the Domitian or the Assumption of Mary. The falling asleep of Mary, Mary's death, when, according to Catholic dogma, her body is assumed, taken up into heaven. Okay? I kind of think it's this, because this is more about Mary than it is about Jesus. And these are the five joys of her son. So probably the ascension. Traditional Christian theology. All of this would be meaningless if this doesn't happen. If the ascension doesn't happen. Okay? Separate. Each one would be meaningless if one of the others doesn't just like. They're all linked together like that. Okay? The fifth five. What time is it? 10.45. The fifth five. Interestingly, this fifth five doesn't get a general rubric, a general name to describe it. It's just a listing. So I've thrown virtues with no question mark after it. Okay? Because each of the things that's described is a virtue. Generosity. What happened to Lonval after he meets this fairy queen? He gave it all away. And the more he gives, the more he receives. Okay? Generosity, we're told. And love of fellow men above all. Those are these two. Okay? What else? Purity, courtesy, we're never lacking. And, kind of interesting, surpassing the others. Wait. Wait. Generosity and love of fellow man above all. And then, and surpassing the others. How can this be surpassing the others if these two are above all? I think it means because these are the first two on the list. That's how they're above all. Notice the one that surpasses the other four. Compassion. And he's deeper than all of them, and dumber than all of them, but he's so much better than all of them. Yes. Let me hold that thought. Who is telling us this about Sir Gallagher? The person telling the tale. Who tells us that he's the weakest and dumbest? Sir Gowan does. Okay. Which is not necessarily the same as the teller of the tale. So that's why I said, or is he not being truthful there in showing humility? But let's assume for a moment he is being truthful, and the poet is telling us this about Sir Gowan. If the poet is telling us this about Sir Gowan, and he's the dumbest and weakest of all of them, what does that say about everyone else? Do they have all this even more? That's why I don't think what he says about himself is true. I think he's demonstrating humility. We are going to find out. I'm going to give it away. It's false humility. He says, I'm the weakest. He says, I'm the dumbest. And he comes to believe, I'm going to refer to all this, he comes to believe his own press clippings. That is, he believes what other people say about him. Sir Gowan, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And after a while, he's kind of like, you know, you're right. I am the greatest thing since sliced bread. And when he does that, boom, he gets his knees knocked out from under him. Okay? So, we're told all this. He gets on his horse. And he rides off into the woods. Okay? 691, he rides through the realm of England in God's name. 
though he found it no pleasure. He makes his way up to North Wales. You can go to the exact places that are described. Goes to the Isle of Anglesey. When um, Prince William was in the Royal Air Force, he flew rescue choppers from the Isle of Anglesey into the into and over, not into, but the Irish Sea and stuff to rescue people and things like that. Okay, he was a rescue pilot. Anglesey's there. If you want to take from north, take a ferry from northern England to Ireland, you go to Holyhead, catch a ferry, and it'll take you across the Irish Sea to Ireland. So that's referred to Holyhead and the Whirl, line 700 and following. Okay. He keeps going. He asks people, so any of you know about a green knight? Green Chapel? And they're like, nope, never heard of it. Goes over strange territory. Finds enemies and such. Page 245, 720 and following. What does he encounter on his journeys? Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Dragons. Wild men. The word, by the way, that is used for wild men, the woad woes, is where Tolkien gets his Woad men in the Lord of the Rings, Gon Burry, Gon, and those others that help Theoden on his way to the defense of Minas Tirith and such. Again, Tolkien edited this. It's pretty much still the standard edition. He edited it in the 1920s. So, dragons, wild men, bulls, bears, boars, ogres, etc. And had he not been valiant and resolute, Trusting in God, notice, just like Beowulf, he surely would have died or been killed many times. Okay? It's cold, it rains, it snows, he's outside in all of that weather. Thus the knight rides across the land, line 734, until Christmas Eve. And he's alone. And he prays to Mary that she would send him guidance to some place where he might lodge and find. Now it's kind of interesting because it says until Christmas Eve. Line 740. Over a hill in the morning in splendor he rides. What does that sound like time wise? Now what day is it? Sounds like it should be Christmas. That is until Christmas Eve, he sees all this stuff, and then in the morning, sounds like Christmas Day. Probably not the case. It's probably in that morning, Christmas Eve morning. In splendor, he rides into a dense forest, wondrously wild. I don't know what wondrously wild means. I've been in a lot of forests before. I used to go backpacking and you know stuff in the Sierra Nevadas, Yosemite and such or the California coastal mountains or giant redwoods and such. Totally cool mountains, uh, trees and stuff. A wondrously wild forest is like full of wonders, like doo -doo -doo, you enter the twilight zone. Well, let's see. Massive gray oaks, hazel, hawthorn, etc. Festooned with shaggy moss, miserable birds, the knight on Gringolet, the name of his horse, hurries under the trees through many a morass and swamp, a solitary figure, troubled about his plight. Why? He's thinking, I need to go to church. I need to attend mass. Because of that Lord who on that same night was born of a maiden, our suffering to end. Sir Gowan's thinking this. I need to go to Mass to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Okay? And so he prays. I beg of you, Lord and Mary, who is gentlest mother so dear, for some lodging where I might devoutly hear Mass. And your matins tomorrow, humbly I ask. That is, in say prayers in the morning. Interestingly, never thought of this, been teaching this poem for over 20 years. What position kind of is he in? Similar to Mary, he's got nowhere to lay his head, right? 2,000 years, well, not 2,000 years, however many years previously, 1,200, 1,300, whatever, 
Mary, Joseph, found themselves same situation, right? They're in Bethlehem, no room at the inn. So, what happens? And to this end, promptly, 757, repeat my pater and ave in creed. His pater nostra, our Father who art in heaven, he prays the Lord's Prayer. His ave Maria, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, etc. And the creed, he recites the creed, okay? All part of one's standard personal devotion, uh, devotionary prayers in the Middle Ages. That is, you might say other prayers, but they would be prefaced with these. Okay? But then we're told top of the next page, 759. Bewailing his misdeeds and praying as he wrote, he often crossed himself, crying, Prosper me, Christ's cross. Dream of the rude, right? So, he prays, but he also simultaneously bewails his misdeeds. He mourns for his personal sin. Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our, depending upon the translation, trespasses, debts, sins, as we forgive others, etc. So that's what he's doing. He's embodying kind of that practice. Prosper me, Christ's cross. It doesn't mean, oh, cross of Jesus, make me wealthy. Prosper me. We have a phrase that's still used today. Godspeed. Or even better, goodbye. What does Godspeed have to do with goodbye? What's goodbye mean? Literally, God be with you. Goodbye is simply a shortened form of that. Like pardon. Pardon means by God. Okay? God, it's still God be with you. Pardu. All right? So prosper me means help me succeed in this, what he's attempting to do. Hardly had he crossed himself three times, and what does he see up ahead? Through the boughs of trees. A moated building standing over a field on a mound surrounded by boughs. So, a moated building on a hill surrounded by trees. This is an image common in mythological literature, folk, fairy tale, etc., of a garden. And at the center of the garden is always a place of temptation. Garden of Eden. So, question. Would he have seen this building if he hadn't said his prayers and crossed himself three times? Notice it's immediately after he says he crosses himself the third time. It appears. I don't know. My own gut is probably not. And the only reason I think that is because of how I read the poem with Sir Gowan's humility and stuff. I think by this point, he is feeling extreme humility, kind of. He's lost. It's Christmas Day now, or it will be in the morning. He has how long to find the Green Chapel? One week. And there this thing appears. Then graciously, he takes off his helmet. Notice, let me back up. This palisade encircles the place. The side of the castle Sir Gallon surveyed as it shimmered and shone through the fine oaks. What does it mean when something shimmers? Go out on a nice hot day in the summer. Get on a good asphalt road and look off in the distance. And you'll see shimmering. What you see off in the distance kind of looks unreal. It takes on an unreal quality. Mirage-like. Okay. What does he do? He pulls off his helmet and he devoutly thanks Jesus and Saint, and Saint Julian, who kindly are both. 
Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me here. Who the hell is St. Julian? Notice you don't have, oh, you do have a footnote. Patron saint of hospitality. It's like, they showed me to this place. Right? So, uh, now good lodging, I beg you to grant. That is, I see the place. Motel 6 sign is up above, you know. Now, let them let me in. So he goes up, knocks on the door. Porter comes to the gate. He asks, go ask your master if I can have lodging for the evening. And the porter says, yes, by St. Peter. And I truly believe you are welcome, sir, to stay as long as you, cheat, as long as you please. He doesn't let him in at that point. He goes and asks the master and then comes back. But why does he say yes by St. Peter? What did Peter, what did Christ, metaphorically at least, give to Peter before, shortly before the ascension? Catholic doctrine. Keys of heaven and hell. Keys to the kingdom. Why does the porter swear by St. Peter? Because he has the keys to the door. Peter is a doorkeeper. Just like Wolfgar was in not Sir Gavin the Green Knight, in Beowulf. Okay? So he goes, the knight said, the owner of the castle says yes, Sir Gavin's brought in. He's given a change of clothes. Line 835. The lord of the castle tells him. You are welcome to do as you please with everything here. All is yours to have and command as you wish. Hospitality, right? That's not my kind of hospitality. If I let somebody stay over, I don't say, anything you want, it's yours. What does the anything include? Everything. It includes anyone. In every one. You know, Lily's going, you. <laughs> well, we're going to see that in a few months. Well, not in a few moments. We'll see it on Thursday. So, Sir Gowan thanks the guy. He's taken to a room, given a bath, he's given clothes, he's given food, the whole nine yards. All right? Um, we're going to skip a whole bunch. When... We're told by discreet inquiry, they learn who he is and where he's from. They learn he's Sir Gowan, and that he's from Arthur's court. They're all happy and pleased. <coughs> and we're told, line 910, all the men in the castle were overjoyed to make the acquaintance quickly. Then of the man to whom all excellence and valor belongs, whose refined manners are everywhere praised, whose fame exceeds any other persons on earth. Each knight whispers to his companion, well, shoot fur. Now we shall enjoy seeing displays of good manners. And what? In the irreproachable terms of noble speech. Why do I do the hick accent? Where are these guys compared to good manners, noble speech? Not. <laughs> this castle is not at the epicenter of good manners and noble speech. This is provincial. And when you use the word provincial to talk about manners and speech and behavior, what do you mean? Not quite up to what uh, the lady who wrote the big giant book on manners. My wife was an MBA student. She had to actually read this because one of her classes was all about business behavior. When you go out on a business lunch with a CEO or somebody important, you better damn know which fork to use and which spoon and the whole nine yards. So when this kind of stuff was drilled, they're saying we don't know proper manners and proper speech. And now we can what? We can learn just by watching and listening to Sir Gowan. Again, this isn't Gowan talking about himself. These are others, okay? In knowledge of fine manners, this man has expertise. I think that those who hear him will learn ah, a little difference. What love talk is. 
we'll learn how to talk about romance. Okay? Skip a little bit. They go off to chapel. Sir Gowan sits with the lord of the castle. The ladies sit in another part. But the lord's wife wants to talk to Sir Gowan. And so two women get up. One is led by another one. The one being led is described as young, beautiful, sexy, gorgeous, whole nine yards. The other one, not. How much not? Do we have time? No, we don't. <laughs> From 947 and following, not. We'll, we'll talk about her and her bulging buttocks and her swarthy chin and all that kind of stuff on Thursday. Um, comment real briefly about papers. I'm going to change. I'm going to give other options. I'm not going to change this. If you want to write a formal academic paper, have at it. Still have to get my approval. But I'm going to expand the opportunities. And I'm, I'm going to write this up in an, either an email or a post and put it on D2L or send it to you. But just to throw it out there. I'm probably going to give you an opportunity if you want to do some kind of reaction slash response. That is, your personal wrestling with something and how whatever it is you read affected you or elicited a response in you. Because I know by looking at some of your faces, we've talked about things, some of this stuff, some of you kind of gone, oh, that's totally cool. And others are like, I want to burn this because you know, it offends my sensibilities. Why? So that's an option. Another possibility, draw a connection between something we've read in here and something today. In other words, to use a word I hate to use, what's its relevance? Okay, I'll give you an example. I think, and I'm pretty sure I suggested it in class, the Lord Thane relationship, in one sense, is still very much alive in modern American. It's not between warriors and the commander in chief. It's not that at all. It's in another aspect of our society. Okay? If you remember what that was, or if you start looking at it, you know, that's an example of something you could look at. Or the idea of you know, Germanic heroism. Is there a relationship of that to today? Or what the wanderer says about bottling everything up and not letting it out. Is that important? How is it important? How, what does it say to you? Again, I'll type this up and send it out later. I just wanted to throw that out in case you wanted to start thinking along those lines. Remember the quiz due Friday over Acts, uh, not Acts, Fits 1 and 2, which we will finish definitely 2 by Thursday. No, I have to touch on it. Yes. Um, I started typing up literally my first paragraph for Beowulf. Uh-huh. Um, 